Okay. Uh, the purpose of this training is to review the changes associated with hybrid resources phase 2B, and it's scheduled uh, to start on February 1st. Back in August, I covered the majority of this material already in the pre-market SIM training, but there's been a few sections that I've updated to clarify uh, the features of this project. So um, nothing is, uh, there's no new uh, pieces to the project, but I did update some of the slides. I'm joined by a number of my subject matter experts who may jump in to help answer your questions. So we'll be hearing from them along the way. And Heidi Carter is my producer in helping me run the session. So if you have questions regarding the WebEx platform, she'll be happy to help you with that. The slide deck has already been posted in the Learning Center on the ISO website. It's also been, it's on the release planning page and the policy initiatives page. And I'll add this recording once we're done. So let's get started. First, in order to distinguish the changes, I wanted to let you know that, you know, what has changed. So I have these two uh, labels, uh, new material, updated material. As I said before, the material in the slides may have been new or updated, but it's not anything new to the project. It's the project still uh, contains the same features that it did, uh, what, you know, all along the way. We have uh, new and updated material on the slide deck though. So for instance, I added this slide. So who is this refresher intended for? So the target audience for this session are entities that are installing new hybrid resources um, because some of the forms have been updated. Entities that have a hybrid resource in the ISO market as of February 1st, and we'll look at all the enhancements that the new initiative brings. And finally, for those that track renewables and storage trends, we're going to look at the changes to today's Outlook and the ISO Today app. So that's our storage and ver data consumers. I couldn't think of a, a, better, a better title for that. So let's uh, start with a few logistics and then we will move on to the material. I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before. Um, this session is uh, scheduled to last an hour and a half. Um, and if you could please keep yourself muted, that would be great. Obviously, if you have a question, unmute yourself, raise your hand. We have sections in the presentation to, um, to take questions. So we'll see your questions in the chat or, um, or uh, see your hand raised and Heidi can make sure that um, we address all of those questions. I see that there's one right now. Is this refresher intended for new and existing co-located resources as well? Certainly, um, uh, co-located resources have a part in this as well. We'll be talking about some features that have been added for them. All right, um, so if you do have a question, and thank you, Mike Whitney, for asking that question, you can either ask it in the chat like Mike did, or you can do it over the phone and you can raise your hand in the WebEx, as I mentioned before. So let's look at today's agenda. In today's session, we're going to cover, we're going to start with a little background, where we've been, hybrid resources, phase one, phase two A, what were those? We're going to talk about uh, what's changed for new projects in phase two B. Then we'll go on to talk about the enhancements. This is probably going to take the longest piece of of this presentation. Uh, what are the enhancements of hybrid resources phase 2B? Then we'll also spend time on the different displays, different applications that have changed in the different reports in OASIS, CMRI, um, ISO Today, and today's outlook. <clears throat> we'll do a small wrap up at the end. So let's start with that background. Co-located resources. So hybrid resources phase one, which went into production uh, December 2020, was where we introduced co-located resources. It allowed individual resources with potentially different SCs and technologies to share a common point of interconnection to the grid. It also introduced the ACC or aggregated capability constraint. And that uh, constraint uh, limits a set of co-located resources that share a common min and max. Next, we had phase two. 
Phase two of the hybrid resource project is an effort to enhance the capabilities for resources uh, that are considered hybrids or co-located. The hybrid model allows for underlying resources to be managed by resource operators as opposed to the ISL. We split this project into three phases. I have the two, first two phases here. Um, phase 2A, we implemented the high sustainable limit and allowed these types of resources to provide ancillary services. Phase 2B, which is going into production scheduled for February 1st, um, we, we uh, are implementing the master and subordinate ACC and the dynamic limit functionality, along with changes to applications and reports. Phase 2C is new, and there's going to be an updated BRS to reflect some of the latest changes to Phase 2C. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. That mean, that update uh, concerns RIMS mostly, I would say. So since I mentioned uh, master ACC, we're going to talk about what we mean by a master and subordinate ACC next and just get our terminology straight. So the first type of ACC is the one that exists today, and we're going to start calling that standalone ACC because it represents one ACC, aggregate capability constraint, with no other ACCs below it. So here's an example of that. In this example, there's four co-located resources behind the point of interconnection that can handle a maximum of 233 megawatts. An ACC is set up to ensure that no more than 233 megawatts will be dispatched from any combination of the resources at once. So now there's another situation where an ACC at the point of interconnect, there is an ACC at the point of interconnection, but there are some additional contractual limitations related to how these resources can be dispatched. In this case, the, AC, the SC would want to set up a master ACC and subordinate ACC. You'll hear that called master and sub ACC. So let's take a look at that. Okay. So in this example, we have one generating facility with four co-located resources. The ACC at the point of interconnection to the facility, just like the last um, example, is 233 megawatts. The resource owner has contracted with two off-takers. The first off-taker on the left receives 110 megawatts of the solar resource and 55 megawatts of the storage resource. The second off-taker on the right has contracts of 123 megawatts of solar and 62 megawatts of storage. The market's going to look at each of these resources individually. However, the master ACC constraint will limit the production to 233 megawatts. In addition, the sub ACC for the resource on the left will limit their production uh, to 110 megawatts, and the second sub ACC will limit the uh, other two resources on the right to 123 megawatts. So the master ACC limits the combined output of all four resources to no more than the studied interconnection capacity at the point of interconnection. The subordinate constraints represent the contractual limitations of the 110 megawatts and 123 megawatts. In the next section, we're going to talk about how co-located resources register to set up these configurations. But first, I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions on this. I see that there is a question. Will the master file support sub ACCs for co-located resources? Oh, when will the master file um, support that? Um, I believe that will be on 2.1. However, I will defer to my subject matter experts if that is not correct. That is correct. All right, thank you very much. I, yeah, so I just wanted to address that because I have a few projects kind of going on right now that were intending to go co-located and we got kind of put in a pickle um, for this uh, 23M3 build, uh, not supporting sub ACCs. And so now we're going to have to be modeled as hybrid and then transition back into co-located. So I just want to make sure 
I'm not wasting anyone's time, effort, and financial um, implications for this kind of transition. Okay, thank you. Sounds like we're going to one. And uh, if you have any, you know, issues or problems, of course, submit a city ticket for your individual situation. Thanks, Cynthia. Did, any, did, okay, did anybody else want to add anything on that? Hey, Cindy, this is Mike. Yeah, and certainly, Vanessa, you can reach out to the NRI team and we can see how that timing may work out, okay? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, your, your team has been supportive thus far. Appreciate it. All right, good. All right. So, Shannon, I can see, asked a question, Shannon from NCPA. If one of the hybrid resources has an outage, does the other, other units max increase? Um, and my, and I'm going to answer this, but if, uh, if I have it wrong, anybody, anybody else can jump in. The, I think you're asking about the sub ACC limit. If, if let's say in our example here on the left, well, yeah, let's say the solar, let's see if one of the hybrids has an outage. So if the one on the left goes out the the solar and solar one and BESS one will the limit for uh, solar two and BESS two increase. I think that's what you're asking. Um, the map in that case or in this example, there's only one other hybrid since there's only two hybrids in here and they they could if they had 200, up 233 megawatts uh, to produce, they could, but in this example, it does, yeah, they could produce up to 233 megawatts on the one side. That would be my answer, unless somebody else can help me out with that. All right, not hearing anything else. I see that there was a question about why we don't use parent and child terminology. This was in a private message. Um, and parent child refers to parent and child resources that a parent resource ID and child resource ID, the child resources are made up, the parent resources made up of the children resources. So it's a little bit different why we chose um, not to uh, to use parent and child. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right. I am. I, I, I do have one more, and I'm sorry to be a stickler. So with this transition um, being accomplished with the master file for 2-1, um, are we going to be able to fit, um, Mr. Turner, uh, these now, I had to do a whole new project number, I had two and blah, 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 new drawings and everything. Would that still be able to be released um, in the March timeframe or should I just be patient until my clients to uh, move on to 23M4? I'm just, it's just, Last week, I heard that it was we had no idea when this was going to happen, and now it's like a week from now, and it's surprising. And I just want to make sure I have the most uh, transparent information provided to my clients. Mike? Yeah. Vanessa, are these uh, resources located within the CAISO BA or outside the CAISO BA? They are pseudotize. Pseudotize, uh, this won't be allowed until the energy and storage enhancements goes live, and I do not know when that enhancement and that initiative will go live. So this functionality is for resources that are within the CAISO BA at this time. Okay, understandably. But uh, since pseudotize are modeled as if they were, quote unquote, internal to the BAA, I just was wondering if that was going to impact those. But okay, that uh, adds to my clarification then. If we can have a follow up, uh, either you know, ISO update or something, when that master file update is available to those kind of folks, that'd be much appreciated. Yeah, again, it'll be the energy storage enhancements uh, initiative that'll allow that, and it's really not necessarily the functionality, but our tariff that prevents that at this time. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I understand. That takes a, quite a bit of time. All right. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to move on. Thank you for those questions. 
So next we're going to talk about a few changes for new projects. Um, I'd say the majority of changes for our new projects are going to be coming in 2C, but for our interconnecting of the grid now, what's going to be changing? Well, we've updated the interconnection request form, um, the project details form, and the new hybrid components tab in the generator resource data template template or GRDT. And uh, we do uh, have uh, information on our website regarding this, and you can see the a link at the bottom there. Um, and you can learn more on the ISO website or attend the next interconnection resource, resource interconnection fair, although I think that the date on that has been moved. So I know there was one that was scheduled, um, but so look, be on the lookout for when the next one of those will be will be happening. I don't have that in my notes right now. So let's take a look at that interconnection request. The internet connection request form is submitted to the ISO to allow the ISO to evaluate requests and determine the megawatts that will be awarded. This form will be updated with drop-down boxes to facilitate submission of hybrid information. This slide is a mock-up of what the form is going to look like, and the items in yellow are the specific changes. You'll be able to enter uh, to select the gen type and fuel type from a drop-down, and then enter the megawatt quantity and check whether it's included as part of the co-located scenario or hybrid, of a co-located scenario or a hybrid. There's also the other box down below there. The other box is another line where additional generation will be added if there's more than three units. Uh, it's also a free form field in case there's a technology that's not listed in the drop-down. The rest of the interconnection request will also be need, need to be completed and submitted as usual. The project details form has also been updated to accommodate this project. So here's project details form and that's used for RIMS for projects in the ISO balancing authority. If you are working on submitting a request for hybrid resource, you'll need to select non-generation from the drop-down as I've shown. And then uh, we'll look at the, the next uh, page of this um, to see what else changes, but you'll select non-generation. So in the generation uh, information uh, page, um, in section 3C, that's where a customer is going to provide the details of their hybrid resource components. First, you would select the proper configuration. I also want to mention that by adding 3C in there, we streamlined the process and removed a box that's further on in section 3G. So it actually is streamlining all forming forms. I'm going to move on to the GRDT next. Uh, this is new material. I just added, this isn't an, a new column or anything. I just added it to the presentation because I, I didn't have a, a screenshot of the resource tab of the GRDT. And really all I'm showing there is that, um, the, that uh, you're going to be, that we, a hybrid resource, excuse me, will have a fuel type of hybrid. So, if you see, uh, I have some um, labels. If they're blue, they're completed by our master file team. And if they are green, they're going to be modifiable by the customer. So in the resource tab, everything you see is going to be completed by the master file team. So the fuel type is hybrid. And that is HYBD, and it's for any mixed fuel resource. So upon go live, the necessary fields will automatically be updated for hybrid resources. For example, the fuel type designation in the resources tab is going to be changed to hybrid. Uh, and also we're going to be setting the market power mitigation flag and the certified RUC flags to no. The ISO sent out notification about this update earlier in the month to all the scheduling coordinators for the resources that could be involved. If you didn't re receive this email, um, you'll probably want to submit a city ticket or uh, contact your client rep as soon as possible. So next we're going to move on to a different tab in the generator resource data template. And that, oh, 
there's those two slides right there. We're going to uh, look at the hybrid components tag, tab. So this is where we're actually getting down to the details of the hybrids. So in column A, we have the resource ID for your hybrid resource. Column B is going to have the ID, the component ID for each one of the components of that resource. So you can see in this example, the resource is example underscore two underscore HYBD1. And as you see there, that's uh, in column uh, rows two, three, and four. But the component IDs are different for each one of those lines because this hybrid resource has three components to it. In column C, you're going to see the type of fuel. On the resource tab, oh, I already said that because we're going to have HYBG for the fuel. But on these, we're going to have, on this tab, we're going to have it broken out. So you can see it's solar, two solars and LESR. Column D is the gen technology type. It's used to identify the technology. The hybrid resource will use the other OTHR in this column, and each component will identify the appropriate technology for that component. And then uh, column E and F are the PMIN and PMAX. These can be modified by users as necessary. So in the next slide, we're going to review some additional columns on the hybrid components tab. So I kind of scooted over to the right, and here are some other columns. The ver identifies if the component is a ver. Y states that it is a ver, wind or solar, and N indicates that it's something else. You might see a Q in this column, and that means the VER is going through evaluation with a forecast provider for 30 days. Presumably, this will change to a Y after that, after that period. The forecast selection is going to show if the forecast is coming from the ISO or if the SC is self-providing this, and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. DISP is the dispatchable flag, and it will have a yes or a no, depending on whether it can be dispatched in real time to be increased or curtailed via the ISO dispatch to supply or consume energy. We've got the minimum and maximum continuous energy limits in the next two columns, and these are for the battery components. Energy efficiency represents the percentage of charging energy that a battery, uh, a battery component can store and later discharge. Um, these are also on the resource tab for regular NGR, these same columns. So that's everything in the uh, GRDT, the Generator Resource Data Template. Let's move on to the action items. So if you are uh, um, a new hybrid resource or implementing a new one, here are the action items you should consider. Use the updated interconnection request form and submit via RIMS. Use the updated project details form and uh, submit the GRDT via RIMS if you're a new resource. And also, if you're an existing resource and you need to update the GRDT, you would use that master file user interface. And Update the modifiable fields that are available to you, and also check those non-modifiable fields for accuracy. And if you have any concerns about that, um, submit those to rdt at caiso.com. So we're going to stop for questions again before we move on. Any questions about the interconnection request form or the GRDT or uh, the project details form? I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, and I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time, but uh, we are keeping an eye on both. Okay, thank you, Heidi. And again, there'll be a time at the end to ask any questions you might uh, think of later. And of course, you can always submit your questions to us as well after the presentation. 
Okay, so now we're gonna get to kind of the bulk of the presentation, the hybrid enhancements and the displays and reports. So first we're gonna talk about, we talked about what a master and sub ACC were, and now we're gonna talk about how you request that and why would you do it? Well, why would you want this type of arrangement? Well, it's used in situations where there's contractual limitations on the components that are subordinate to the aggregate capacity constraint of the interconnection. And this is important so that co-located resources are dispatched appropriately. So, Mike, this is something that, that applies specifically, Mike Whitney, to co-located resources. So what are the action items? Well, if you're in the ISO BA and you want to implement this mass, new master and sub uh, uh, arrangement, you're gonna work with the ISO contracts department and make sure that you get it set up in your PGA. If you're a WEIM participant uh, with a new resource, you're gonna to wanna to include that in your SC request letter and you're gonna work with Nicole and our customer readiness group to make sure that that's implemented. And existing resources should, if you have existing resources that you want to um, prepare this arrangement for, you would submit a city ticket. I see TJ has a question. Will the GRDTs provided for testing be automatically moved per, to production once the hybrid initiative is implemented? I'm gonna look to uh, my subject matter experts for that. Mike or Ann, do we automatically move the GRDT to production? Hear me? Oh. Hi, this is Ann. So we, hi. So um, we, uh, in terms of for two one, I'm sorry I missed the context of the question, but in terms of for two one for go live, is that what the uh, what the question is referring to? TJ, are you you're referring to yes for two one? Mm -hmm. So for the hybrid resources. <clears throat> that are um, the resources that were, have been identified as mixed fuel. We have sent out um, emails to the SEs to, um, to review their GRDTs that are currently, that we're currently in the map stage environment and to let us know of any um, revisions that were needed. And so those responses that I've received back from those people, from those entities are what will be um, put into the production environment. Does that help, TJ? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. And uh, is there any further opportunity to make changes to those, or when's the deadline for that? Um, for 2-1, yes, we have um, probably up through maybe Thursday of this week um, to get them in for 2-1. And you can certainly make revisions um, ongoing. It'll just, it would just be the, the five-day business um, day turnaround time for master file changes. I appreciate it, Ann. Thank you. Sure. All right, any other questions? Uh, we do have Mike with his hand raised. You want to go ahead, well, Mike? This is the, uh, hi, this is Mike from CES. Um, will we are will we be able to see the effective RDT parameters in Cyber as a for for two one as of tomorrow? So the two. I'm sorry, the effective RDT in Cyber. Yes, yeah, so would we be able to see the any changes that were made uh, to the resources that are impacted by this in cyber tomorrow? So if some uh, resource is going from a, a, a generator to an NGR or vice versa, or any any relevant changes, would we see that in the two one uh, day ahead market opens for two one tomorrow? Ah, uh, Mike, uh, what, I'm wondering, Wendell, are you on the phone? Yeah. Yeah. That? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So not in cyber. Um, so if the effective date is two one, 
then the first time you would see it would be on 131 when we read in the master file for the effective date 21. So it's basically like a resource transfer almost, and that we'll we'll be able to see it like midnight on 131. 131, uh, yeah, it's after midnight though. Uh, the master file workflow won't run until 1:15 a.m. for the next day. So by by 1:30, um, you should be able to see. It. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think I saw another hand raised there. Heidi, did Mark, did you have your hand raised, Mark Richardson? No? I don't oh. see it right now. Sorry, right. Cynthia. I was going to answer uh, Mr. McGuffin's question, but Wendell took it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, any other questions? I'm not oh. seeing any hand I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the FC forecast selection. As I mentioned, when we were talking about the RDT, you could choose to provide your own forecast or use the ISO forecast. So, as a result of hybrid resources phase 2B, SCs for hybrid resources have the option to submit their own forecast rather than the ISO's forecast. It's really, it's not a new feature since SCs can submit their own forecast now through cyber. But after our implementation, it's going to be done directly into ALFS, our forecasting application. If you choose this option, your forecasting fee is going to be waived. So the question, is this available for other VER resources? Yes, it already exists. It, yes, for dispatch and settlement purposes only. An ISO forecast will still be needed for forecasting internal dot formation and will still have a forecasting fee. Uh, how do SC submit them? Well, you can submit them via uh, uh, to su submit them using an API via ALPS. And if you want to know the technical specs for that, you can see I have the link on the bottom to the developer site. So let's uh, move on. I think I have a picture of that. So signing up. If you are a new customer and you're EIM. Uh, you would request this during your onboarding process to provide your own forecast. If you're an ISO BA participant, you would request it during your NRI process, the new resource interconnection process. If you're an existing customer that wants to switch forecast options, you would submit a city ticket with this request. I think I heard somebody, does somebody want to ask a question? No? Okay. Yeah, hi, Cynthia. This is, this is Mike McGuffin again from CES. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so jumping back a slide, I, I was under the impression that the ISO would assess the uh, 10 cents per megawatt hour forecasting fee regardless of what uh, what selection was chosen, whether you submitted the uh, forecast yourself or if you utilize the ISO forecast. Um, it, is that not so that that's not the case? Uh, well, let, I'm going to hand it over to Amber. Yeah, good morning, everybody. This is Amber from the forecasting side. Um, so for hybrid resources with a VER component, you get to have the selection option. Um, that allows you the selection to choose ISO forecast or SC forecast. This is for hybrid VER components. The B is not associated if you are a hybrid ver component and you chose sc forecasted there are requirements um, you still have to meet the meteorological station requirements the meteorological data feed requirements and you have to submit the sc forecast that you're generating for that ver component to the iso but you would not be charged the fee um, for other renewable resources um, that is different, um, so I'll go into that if you guys need it, but um, for the hybrid resources, you do have an either or option. And if you choose SC forecasted, you are not assessed the fee, but you are still required to give all the appendix Q information that's required. 
um, as well as the forecast that you're using um, for that ver component. I hope that helps. Okay, yes, th thanks. So it is different than a, a traditional ver where you would be charged either way. Um, so how, how Correct. Does that yeah, the traditional vers are charged either way. You do have that like stage four option, right? Where you can go through the process and then also have the SE selected option, but you're still charged. Um, but yeah, the hybrids are different. Okay, thank you. Thanks for confirming that, Amber. I appreciate it. Other questions on that? I'm not seeing any, Cindy. All right, so uh, I'm just showing you here on our developer site, um, if you are <clears throat> uh, looking for the information about the API, uh, you can go to our developer site, choose ALPS, and uh, pick up those technical specs. All right, so what are your action items if this is what you wanna do? If you're a new customer, you're gonna indicate your forecast choice during your onboarding process. If you're an existing customer and you want to change it, submit a city ticket and let us know. And then once you're, you've got that going, uh, where you wanna start submitting your forecast via ALPS and not in cyber. I'm gonna move on to dynamic limits. This is the topic of conversation we've had a lot of discussion on. All right, so what are dynamic limits? Well, dynamic limits are minimum and maximum megawatt limits for hybrid resources that can be submitted for every five minute interval. And why is it important? It enables scheduling coordinator to limit the dispatch instructions from ISO, from, from the ISO for positions of the bid curve that are unavailable for dispatch based on actual production limitations for that resource. And you submit them using an API or you can use cyber. So whenever an SC submits a bid for a hybrid resource, there should also be a dynamic limit submitted as well. So that lets, as I mentioned, that lets the market know the resources min and max operating limits for a rolling six hour window. It's similar to the way we do forecasts for VERS today. So dynamic limits are meant to place limits on how the resource clears the market, not so much how the resources are dispatched, not directly. Uh, dynamic limits are only meant to interact with the market and not ADS directly, and they limit the FMM and RTD awards, but not the dispatch. So what happens if you don't submit dynamic limits? Well, first of all, if you're not gonna submit dynamic limits, please let, uh, let us know if you're having a problem doing that or something, um, contact our, our operators and let, you know, let them know that you're, you are unable to submit them. But if you don't, what cyber is gonna do is if the resource has an energy bid, a dynamic limit will be created using the min and max of limits of the bid. If the resource doesn't have an energy bid, but has a self schedule, um, that dynamic limit will be created using self-schedule as both the min and max dynamic limit. And if the resource has none of these indicating they did not submit a bid, then no dynamic limits needed. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So let's take a look at an example. So hybrid resources are modified as a single unit, as we know but each underlying unit component of that could have its own operating challenges. Since the operation of each resource in a hybrid configuration is managed by the SC and submitted as a single bid, there needs to be a way to let the ISO know the operating capabilities of the resources within the hour. That way the ISO will ensure that the dispatch for the resource is feasible. In this example above, let's say that at this time of the day, the storage component of the resource does not have su sufficient SOC or state of charge to produce any megawatts, but the solar resource is typically able to provide 25 megawatts. On this day, the forecast shows there may be clouds during the hour, so the 25 megawatt bid might be unattainable for the entire hour. The SC will be able to let the ISO know the capabilities of the hybrid resource without submitting multiple outage cards. In fact, you should not submit multiple outage cards 
Um, instead, you should use the dynamic limit tool. It's also possible for the dynamic limit to exceed the economic bid limit and potentially allow for a resource to be dispatched above or below the bid in amount. So let's learn how to submit these limits. All right, so dynamic limits can be used, uh, can be submitted using the API. Again, I uh, have a picture of the developer site and the, cy the cyber um, uh, category, if you will. And then uh, also you can submit them in cyber um, using our market participant portal. You can go to cyber and we're gonna walk through submitting uh, the, these limits. So let's take a look at cyber. There is a new tab in cyber that's titled dynamic limits. Once, once there, enter the date and SCID and press apply. Then you're gonna click the icon at the top left to create the dynamic limit. This will open up the following box. Select the resource from the dropdown and add the min and max value, then click Create. The table will then be populated with the information you entered. To edit this information, click the pencil icon. You can see it's on each line or for the whole thing. Um, when you uh, hit the double arrow icon, oh, to submit, you hit the double arrow icon or the triple arrow icon next to create. The triple arrow icon uh, will submit the, all the dynamic limit data and the double arrow will only submit the selected rows. And then you're gonna click apply to save those changes. So dynamic limits, what do we need to do as a scheduling coordinator? You're gonna need to submit them using the user interface in cyber or the API. And you're gonna submit that min and max for every five minutes. And there's uh, four different um, scenarios where you would wanna do this. Ambient unavailability, unavailability due to lack of fuel or state of charge, or if you're reflecting on-site charging. So those are four scenarios could alter um, uh, the amount of output that you're, you can provide and you would reflect that in your dynamic limits. I think I'll, I don't have a question uh, uh, slide here, but I think I will stop and see if there are any questions. And I see... We do have a chat from TJ, and, or a question from uh, TJ in the chat. <laughs> Uh, yes, from chat in the TJ. All right, thank you, TJ. It says, does the market treat the lower dynamic limit act as a PMIN or self-schedule? For example, if uh, a 120 megawatt hybrid resource is expecting 90 to 100 megawatts of solar output, and they set the lower limit to 90, and the market can only support 89 megawatts, from an economic point of view, would the market treat the 90 megawatt lower limit as the PMIN and therefore decommit the resource, uh, zero megawatt dot, or would it treat it, the limit as a self-schedule and drive the price negative to accommodate the self-schedule? Um, I am going to, it looks like, uh, can one of my subject matter experts uh, respond to that? Kevin, did you, uh, were you gonna respond to this question? Yeah. Hey, Cindy, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yep, um, there you go. Okay, great. Hey, this is Kevin Head from the Market Analysis and Forecasting Group. So th thanks, TJ, for the question. Uh, so it, the market will treat it effectively as like a lower limit. It'll be the uh, sort of like a PMIN for the resource. Um, we will, you know, in the case that you lay out, uh, schedule it force it to be scheduled between 90 and 100 megawatts. We won't be committed. Um, you know, we don't really have a concept of commitment for non-generating resources, but 
yeah, we, we would schedule it at 90 megawatts. I'm not sure whether it would drive the price negative. I imagine it just sort of depends on the circumstance. But, yeah. Did that help, TJ? Yeah, he, he, he said he would treat it like a PMAN, but then his description made it sound like he's actually going to treat it like a, a self-schedule. Um, I, so I think I understand. Um, Well, if you think of additional questions, we can come back to this at the end and, um, or you could, you know, you could submit a city ticket if you have further questions later. I appreciate it. All right. Thank we're, you. We're going to move on and talk a little bit about metering and telemetry. I have this as new material. I did have a slide on it before, but there have been some questions about metering and telemetry. So I thought I would um, bring in uh, information from another presentation that we have. I, I do see that there is another question on dynamic limits, so let me look at that before I talk about this. Uh, is it required to submit dynamic limits? I thought that it was, it was, but this presentation seems like it's optional. Um, it, the expectation is that when you have a hybrid resource and you're submitting bids, you're, you should be submitting dynamic limits. The tariff, uh, I believe it's in the tariff that you should be submitting those. Um, but if something were to happen and the dynamic limits were not submitted, uh, I was just telling you what would happen uh, from the perspective of the ISO. Uh, if any of my subject matter experts want to add on to that, uh, that would be great. Anyone? No. No, I think we're good. Oh, I see, I guess there are some hands up. Is that, is that the case, Heidi? Yes, we actually, um, first hand up that we have is Tom Watson. Tom, if you wanna go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, maybe I misheard what was said, um, but I thought um, in the beginning of the discussion on dynamic limits, it was stated that they could be used to increase your bid. Um, is that true? I believe they can be higher than your bid. Uh, you know, you have a bid and your dynamic limit, let's say you can, you find that in that five minute interval or whatever interval you're talking about, um, that you have more availability, then yeah, you can do that. Okay, so if I have a bid in for 25 megawatts, I can put a dynamic limit in for 30. Right, That's the bid would be extended. Yeah, framed by the Pmax, of course. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Does that effectively extend the bid at uh, the same price and all that uh, the 25 megawatt point would have been submitted at? I believe that's so, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Thank all you. right. Any, we, we have a couple of other hands, but real quick before we do that, there was a, a question in the chat uh, from Sandra Moore. Is it yeah. required? submit dynamic limits? I thought it was, but in this presentation, it seems like it's optional. And right. another, is it deemed to be a tariff violation if we do not submit? I think I, I answered the first question. Um, and the second question, I am going to look to my subject matter experts if, uh, you know, if it is a tariff violation. Um, and what I'm seeing is, what I'm being told is that the tariff requires it. So yes, it would be a tariff violation if you don't submit it. Does that okay, help? Great. Sandra, sorry. Yeah, all right. Thank you. And then and our next person with their hand up is Net Hankin. So I hope I said your name right. <laughs> yes, okay, you did. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to, I know I asked this question via email. Um, but hearing that it's a it's a tariff violation, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. For the hours that our resource is not available, for example, um, our ending one through six, most of the time, since it's, it's a solar resource, hybrid resource, um, I know that we cannot submit a dynamic limit of zero. So mm -hmm. it is okay to not have dynamic limits for those hours, right? And it, they will just be based on the dynamic limits will be automatically created based on so if, our, our bids. If it's not available, then it sh there shouldn't be a bid, right? If you don't have the 
capacity to provide. And then if you do submit a bid and then it, it goes down to zero or, or you could put in a self schedule of zero. Correct. So we, if we don't submit bids, we're not going to be required to have dynamic limits for those hours. Is that correct? If you, well, you only need to have a dynamic limit if there is a bid. So, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, we have another hand raised and that's uh, Nick Ramstel. Hi, uh, yeah, um, I think maybe just similar to one of the earlier questions, but I just wanted to make sure I understand as well. So. Um, in that example that you showed of where the bid is 25 megawatts, um, but then, um, yeah, it, so then in that window, then, um, you know, if the upper, if the upper and lower limit is, you know, slightly above and the lower limit is then, you know, one megawatt, as you show it here, um, what would be the, the, uh, resource be expected to discharge there if, um, would it be the, the upper limit or would it be the original uh, cleared volume in the bid? I am going to hand that off to one of my subject matter experts. Can anyone help uh, with this question? Hey, Cindy, um, this is Gabe Murtaugh from Policy. Um, I, I may not have a, a full handle on this question, but I am. Yeah, I, I think part of part of, part of the answer is at least that you know you've got a hybrid resource, so you know it could potentially be a solar plus storage, could potentially be two other technology types. Um, you're only receiving one dispatch instruction from the ISO, and your job as a hybrid resource is to follow that dispatch instruction. So if you get it, you know, if you get a dispatch instruction, that's the energy that we expect from your combined resource, solar and storage, going onto the grid. We're not specifying how much has to come from the storage resource. We're not specifying how much has to come from the solar resource. It can be any combination um, as long as we are getting the energy that's been requested and scheduled by our markets. D does that help to answer the question, or did I did I not understand what you were getting at? Um, yeah, so I think maybe what I'm trying to understand is like the you know, whether the upper limit can be used, you know, to limit the dispatch. So say if you, you know, in the peak solar hours and you did have a higher state of charge, uh, you know, you may be able to discharge higher than what the original bid was. But yep. you you know, you obviously you submitted a bid for that reason that you didn't want yep. to. But so but if the resource was actually capable of say producing, say in this example, twenty seven megawatts. Yeah. And that would be your upper limit, but your original bid was twenty five. Would you then be expected to discharge at your upper limit of 27 or would it be your original bid of 25? So, the, I mean, the whole point of the dynamic limits is that you're accurately representing what your upper and lower limit of operation is. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually, you know, if, if you anticipate that in a particular five minute period, you can actually produce 27 megawatts. And that's what you put as your upper hybrid dynamic limit for that five minute interval. And the ISO dispatches you at 27 megawatts. Um, you know, the expectation there is that you would be delivering 27 megawatts. Um, the hybrid dynamic limit really isn't designed as a tool to just say, mm, you know, during this interval, I really only feel like providing 25 megawatts. So it really shouldn't be used, and, and I, again, I think that this is specified, um, and it was certainly specified in the tariff, yeah. um, I, I, in the policy, excuse me, um, that the hybrid dynamic limits really are supposed to represent upper and lower limits. Okay. Does that, does that help? Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Great. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. Right. And also, just to add one other thing there, Remember that these dynamic limits affect the awards and not the dispatch specifically. So um, there's been a lot going on here in the in the chat. So let's see here. Sandra, Emily, 
Emily B. from Shell, is there a requirement on how often the dynamic limits are updated? Um, they should be updated every five minutes for, a, for, a, for the rolling six hours. Uh, I would suppose if that means if you have bids in for that. But it should be, it, uh, it should be for every five minutes. Uh, let's see here, moving down. Uh, how about a self-schedule? A self-schedule is uh, like a bid, Sandra. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And Alva, couldn't there be a bid for the battery portion of the resource even if the solar was at zero? Yes, that is true. There could be uh, a battery. Uh, just uh, your bid could be for just the battery and you would be submitting dynamic limits for that. Um, let's see, going on. Andre, Go that's the, um, Tom Watson has his hand raised before TJ's question in the chat. So if you oh. want to go ahead, Tom, and for your question. I actually have two questions. First one is I've, I've heard this twice, and again, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but uh, just a few seconds ago, it was stated again that dynamic limits, I think the statement was affects the market, but not the dispatch. Is that correct? That is my understanding, and I, I can let one of my subject matter experts expand on that. Because um, what that says to me is the resource is going to get dispatched for something different than the market award. And again, maybe I'm misunderstanding. Can someone jump in and help help on that? Oh, um, uh, hi, this is Yannick from California ISO. Um, so the dynamic limits are only affecting uh, how the market cares, right? It put effective limits on how a, unit, a resource can care in the market. And so the market cares, and in principle, um, your DOT we sent, we, we sent to your resource should be equal to the energy award of the resource, right? So in a way, because we limit how your resource can clear the market is going to indirectly impact uh, the dispatch. But yeah, the dynamic limit doesn't put a limit on dispatch. If the market says your resource should be dispatched at 10 megawatts, then that's what your DOT should be and you should, you should follow it. That's the way it works. Okay, I'm, I'm still kind of misunderstanding what you're saying. So, use uh, numbers here, got a resource with a bid mm -hmm. for 30 for an hour, we put a dynamic limit of 25. Mm -hmm. The market will limit awards for those applicable intervals to 25, correct? That's correct, yes. What will the yes. dispatch be? The dispatch should be, should be 25. If the market is at 25, it should be 25. Okay, so uh, that's the part I don't understand when you say it affects the market, but not the dispatch. Um, so maybe well, it's the, just the, the dispatch, the, the DOT is, or is, is going to be based on how the market clears. So if, if the energy bid clears at 25, that's the DOT we're going to send to the unit. Okay, okay fair enough. Um, second question. Um, what about using the lower limits to avoid solar curtailment? I'm sorry, go ahead. I suppose that, yeah, I suppose that should work. I mean, it's in a similar vein as uh, one of the previous questions, like the market is going to treat it as a self schedule. So if you, if you increase your lower dynamic limits, uh, past zero, which is greater than zero, then uh, market is going to try to to dispatch. Well, it's going to try to clear the unit uh, above that lower dynamic limit. So effectively, uh, it's going to act like a step schedule. I understand it would work, but the question is: is it within the letter and intent of the tariff? Because I, I thought the draft tariff language said uh, it used. Yeah. Uh, dynamic limits should be the economic limits of the unit. So if I see my resource getting curtailed and I don't want that and I raise the dynamic limit, is that okay? 
Yeah, Tom, let me let me step in and answer this. Uh, this is Gabe Murtaugh again from the policy group. Um, I, th I think in the policy we outlined three different scenarios where you could potentially use and you should be using um, hybrid dynamic limits. The um, first scenario is obviously if you have limited availability for fuel for um, generation from a renewable resource. So the wind's not blowing, the sun's not shining, you can't, you know, you're bidding in your PM into your PMAX, you can't reach your PMAX because the sun's not shining and all you've got is a battery and it's and it's got less capacity than your full capacity that you, you've got interconnection rights to. So it's, it's less than your PMAX. So you put in a hybrid dynamic limit to say, gee, in this hour, you know, my, my typical um, PMAX is 100 megawatts. I can only produce 50 because I've only got my, fi my 50 megawatts for my battery. The second scenario is if you're either at max state of charge or you're at min state of charge and you can't use output from your battery. So you're anticipating 80 megawatts from the solar resource. You don't have any state of charge in your battery, or maybe you have very, very low state of charge in your battery. Um, so, so you're not anticipating any generation being capable from the battery. So you submit an upper, uh, upper hybrid dynamic limit of 80 megawatts. Obviously, you could do the same thing if you've got a, um, a situation where you've got maximum state of charge and the battery isn't capable of charging, maybe your um, high, lower hybrid dynamic limit is zero megawatts in that scenario. The third scenario is if you want to manage on-site charging. And obviously, this is one of the situations where you know, the ISO acknowledges that one of the benefits to hybrid resources is that um, it allows the ability for the resource um, to sort of manage what's going on underneath of the hood. You know, we've got one set of bids at the ISO sees, we've got one dispatch instruction coming from the ISO, but the actual operators of the resources, um, you know, may want to be charging during some periods, uh, may, want, may not want to be using as much uh, solar resources. So those are sort of the, the three different scenarios, the three different situations where we're saying for these scenarios, you can use the dynamic limits. Um, if, if you re so in a situation where you wouldn't want to curtail solar, um, you know, if if you've got a you know solar resource is capable of producing 100, a storage resource is capable of 50, um, and you've got a Pmax of 100 megawatts, you certainly wouldn't be setting a hybrid dynamic limit at less than 100 megawatts. Um, during those hours because you'd be able to produce more than that. That's that's not what the hybrid, hybrid dynamic limit would do or should be used for. Uh, Does that help I, at all? I understand all that. I guess the question uh, is more related to when solar is producing and the battery's full and there's a dispatch instruction to reduce solar. Right. Uh, we don't so, do that because the solar yeah. is capable of continued production. Can we use a lower dynamic limit a uh, higher, a uh, higher lower dynamic limit to avoid those curtailments. That's the question. I uh, let me let me think about that a little bit more. I I suspect that that would fall under um, you know on-site charging, which is kind of that third third category yeah. that we talked about. Yeah. Um, but let's let me think about that a little bit more. The other thing I would say is you know you. You definitely want to be thinking about how you're bidding the resource in those scenarios too, uh, because bids are going to impact where where the resource and how the resource is scheduled. Understood. Okay, because uh, the, again, there's that word economic or that term economic limits in the tariff language, which uh, tells me that this should be okay. But um, just wanted to clarify. Yeah, let's let's follow up with with this one. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, um, I see that there's still some additional questions. Um, TJ, it sounds like uh, will, you said, will the dynamic limits limit AGC dispatch? And is there a scenario where the dispatch will be different from the market? That statement's very confusing. And I'm looking to see if maybe we can put together some examples and post them afterwards of when that, and maybe we're splitting hairs here. Um, I'm not really quite sure, 
but we can clarify that um, at, with uh, something after this call. Would that work for you, TJ? Okay. Yep. Okay. We do have one more hand raised. It's uh, oh. Devin from CES. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, thanks. This is Chris Devin from Customized Energy Solutions. Um, so I guess, let me just start with a question on this uh, slide. Are these, in this API and cyber, are you guys going to require that these um, dynamic limits actually have a, like a, a, you know, use reason behind it being submitted from one of these four or five um, various options here? Um, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to answer this question and see if uh, others uh, have additional. Um, I believe you're going to submit the, um, the numbers in cyber, but there's not a place where you're going to put the reason why. However, we would assume that you're going to follow, you know, the tariff rules. So, um, anybody okay, else want to so, add? So this list is just reflecting those are the, those are the appropriate mechanisms in the tariff. Uh, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. So then I have a follow up to that. Well, sorry, I guess I should let, if anyone else has any other clarifications to that, like you were asking, if not, I do have a follow up. Are there any other questions? Yeah, it's really, it's, it's related to the, it's related to the, um, the, the stuff that Gabe was just describing on the use for like the on site charting, because this is a point where it's just been very unclear to me from even during the policy development and then the tariff. What is allowable and what is not allowable? Because it sounds like it, we, it sounds like I'm hearing that the ISO say 2 different things. I'm hearing that you can reflect your on site charging. And basically change your upper economic limit downwards uh, to set the upper dynamic limit in a way that you can reflect if you choose to move solar into the storage um, as you so choose, essentially. But then I'm also hearing Gabe saying that it should be reflecting their true upper economic limits. And in that case, then that really shouldn't be allowed, I don't think. And and so I, I just, it, I don't believe the tariff is clear enough on this. And I'd like to try to get some more final clarification here on this training if possible. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, as Gabe mentioned earlier, we're going to, we're going to take this offline and come back to you um, with some additional information. So. Okay. Some would... example examples would be really helpful on this 1, because it's really hard just to talk through what is okay and what is not okay. Uh, theoretically, so I would really encourage maybe another follow up with some examples and, and I'd really appreciate that. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Anyone else. Uh, this is Carrie with the Western Power Trading Forum. Um, just a clarification, when you said take it offline and um, get back to Chris um, and Tom, do you mean just them? Because this is something um, I think a lot of people would be interested in the answer. No, I think that we can uh, post something in addition uh, to this, like in, in the Learning Center with this presentation uh, or, you know, associated with this presentation. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. All right, I think I'm going to move on. Um, quick question, Cindy. Um, there is a note from Nick saying the examples will be helpful. Uh, do we think that this will be provided before 2-1? Some more details in this uh, part of the presentation. So metering and telemetry, each VER resource, uh, each uh, hybrid resource, the VER and storage components must have metering and telemetry, telemetry because they impact the settlement visibility and reporting for these resources. And you'll see that later when we look at the reports. And where can you learn more about this? Well, the BPM for metering outlines all of the requirements. I have the link to that down at the bottom. Um, I do see from Nick, you're asking the examples that we were just talking about. Will this be provided prior to Q1? Um, I think we'll do our best to do that. Uh, I, I can't, you know, we, we need to talk about it um, and, and uh, get that done, but um, we'll do our best to get that done for you. Unless I get some commitment from, from my subject matter experts right now. So, 
All right, so why do we need this metering and telemetry? Well, first let's talk about the metering. Hybrid resources are required to have revenue quality meters for all of our components to enable the ISO to properly calculate the forecasting fee. If we don't have the VER piece of it broken out, we cannot, um, we can't um, um, calculate the forecast fee properly. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. And then when it comes to the telemetry and why is that important? Well, it, there's two main reasons. The visibility in the actual operation of each component. Um, we need to know uh, energy before energy and ancil ancillary services. And so we can do a good quality forecast. And also, we have reporting requirements with the CPC, CEC, Regis, WEC, and you'll also see how this is going to impact today's outlook and ISO today. If we don't have the telemetry from the battery piece of the hybrid, we can't accurately put that in our battery trend chart, for instance, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, and when we look at the report. So uh, that is why we are requiring that metering and telemetry for hybrid uh, resources. I'll stop for questions. I see Sandra has one. Uh, where do we stand on the availability of DC revenue quality meters? Um, uh, Hi, Priyanka or Mike? Idea. Okay, Priyanka. Yeah. Hi. Um, so the DC revenue meters, the option we have currently available is for the scheduling coordinator metered entity. So if the resources have the DC meters, then you always have an option for your SD to submit the data to ISO, uh, to ISO set MRIS uh, system directly. If it is an ISO any resource, then uh, we have some options available, uh, but again, it depends on the individual meter configuration. So if it is that something you are interested in, um, so please reach out to us uh, along with the project details and we'll see uh, what other devices you have that have acceptable accuracy to ISO and how we can uh, get the work component meter data if the resource is ISO any. Did that help, Sandra? All right, great. Um, other questions? I think I saw Kathleen had a question. Yep, Kathleen's got her hand raised. Great, thank you. I'll be quick. Uh, Kathleen Colbert from District. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, my question was along the same lines on the DC revenue quality meters. Um, your example here, Cindy, while helpful, is is really high level and and some of the confusion over implementation is on a much more granular level of when you say component, what do we mean by component um, in the overall configuration? So like at the plant level, but then you built down, <coughs> excuse me, into <coughs> the different resources. And within the resources, there's, there's components. And so I think I'm still confused. Uh, and I was wondering if you could build out the example. If you go back a slide, like if you can see what I mean, uh, I think, um, or to the, the graphic. Yeah, so like this example, um, is there a place where we can see when you say component, what you mean by component visually? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so oh, down, okay. yes. Everything that has a component ID. Um, in the master file would be considered a component. I mean, I can add another component, but you know, you have your resource ID and you have component IDs for each each one of the uh, generating or storage resources under your resource ID. So each one of those component IDs is a component. Yeah, there are examples, metering examples in the hybrid uh, phase two B. Uh, proposal, uh, draft final proposal or final proposal, you can see some metering um, examples of these where the meter should be located. So what we are asking is the work to be measured separately for the hybrid resource uh, for the reasons that uh, Cindy has mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. And, and I recall that there were some challenges and we were a little concerned about the accuracy of that uh, because of the DCAC coupling. Um, in that specific scenario have, and, and I know we asked for follow-up stakeholder meetings on that and some additional examples like really zooming in on this issue, which, which we did not tackle during the policy phase. We, 
we did not we, tackle the DC complexity. Um, have we, we did, have you been provided uh, we did, those yet? Mm -hmm. We did have a follow-up meeting after the original okay. presentation, uh, specifically okay. on the metering topics, and uh, we went in detail um, about various scenarios and how the metering can be done. Um, so as I was mentioning before when Sandra asked the question, so if you have a DC coupled resource, and if it is SEME, yes, you can have a DC meter and submit the work um, component meter data directly to MRIS. If it is an ISME resource, then individually, uh, project by project basis, if you can reach out to us, we will look into the metering configuration and see uh, what other devices can be used um, for the work component data. Um, thanks, Priyanka. I guess I'm trying to get caught back up on that follow-up meeting. Is there a link to the recording that Cindy or Katie could share? Yes, there is. Um, we, if you go to the Learning Center and you go to New Modules, uh, there, there were two sessions where we, um, where we uh, did some additional training specifically regarding metering and telemetry, um, and we did record one of those, so you can find it there. Okay, great. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. All right. Um, I, in the interest of time, I am going to go through all the displays and reports, and then I'll stop for questions at the end. Okay. So uh, the first, uh, it, I, I added this in about ADS. There were some questions about the follow dot flag. So as, as most people know, ADS is an application used to communicate real-time dispatch instructions to scheduling coordinators. And there's no new displays, there's nothing changed. However, the rules associated with the follow dot flag have been expanded to include situations where VER resources have AS awards. So currently, the existing criteria for the follow dot flag is if there is an opera, if the, the follow dot flag is Y, if there's an operating instruction in place and the SUP is a greater than zero, or less than zero, sorry. Um, additional criteria um, is, let me look at this. Yep, if dispatch will be above, okay. Uh, the additional criteria that has been added is a VER associated with a co-located or hybrid resource if it has an AS award, a VER associated with a co-located resource within a standalone ACC has an AS award, or all VERs in a subordinate ACC if any resource has an AS award. So these are um, the additional criteria where you will see the follow dot flag will be a Y. So again, standalone is if there's just a one ACC, Subordinate means there's a master and subordinate ACCs. I'm going to move on to BAYOP, which is a WEIM application. There's a new display called Dynamic Limits. Additionally, there are some new columns in uh, some existing um, um, uh, mon uh, operator screens uh, on BAYOP. So let's take a look at those. So uh, first, uh, we have the Coming Soon tab, and uh, there are three reports. Two of them already exist. The last one is a Dynamic Limits report, as you see there, and we're going to be moving these out. So the real-time dispatch, as you can see on the far right there, RTD, RTPD, STUC, and RTBS. So the real-time dispatch will display the dynamic uh, limits in five-minute intervals. The RTPD is going to just, uh, which is pre-dispatch, is going to show it in 15-minute intervals, calculated as the average of the corresponding three five-minute intervals. The STUC is short-term unit commitment. It looks out four hours, displays on 15-minute basis, like RTPD, the average of the corresponding and most up-to-date at runtime, three five-minute intervals. And RTBS is the real-time base schedule and we'll show the 15-minute basis of the dynamic limit data. Um, again, calculated as uh, the average of the three corresponding five-minute intervals used for hybrid resources in the bid range capacity and flex ramp efficiency test. So let's look at uh, that report just as an example. 
On the left side of the screen, the operators are going to see the interval as well as the upper and lower limits for each resource. The right side of the screen will display the PMIN and PMAX and the online status, the AS awards, and the dispatch operating target, and also if there's any market override. Um, when we move this report, it's going to be moved to the EIM uh, tab. Under that, it'll be EIM and then a dynamic limits report. Next are the ACC constraints. ACC constraints screen, we added a new column to identify if it's a master or sub. If you click on the master resource, it's going to um, display the sub resources in the table at the right. In the future, we're also going to have standalone there as well. Um, this report is also going to be moved to the EIM tab under transmission, then co-located resources, and then ACC constraints. The other report in BAYOP is ACC schedules. That is this little messy here, and you can see that we also have that type column here. We've also updated the energy schedule, energy SCED, and we changed the SCED to uh, energy and AS, and it breaks out the energy piece um, and it's updated from, this is the part that was updated from the previous session. So we, we now have the energy SCED and energy and AS to break things out more specifically. The colors, you see the red there, you probably will never see that. If the market exceeds the ACC limit, it will turn red for that ACC and the relevant interval. We do not expect this to occur, but in the event that it happens, uh, we've got that red. The orange is the same thing, but it's for the sub-ACC. This report is going to move again to the EIM tab and the transmission and then co-located resources um, uh, reports. In OASIS, there are no new reports, but we're at, oh, excuse me, there's no existing reports impacted, but there is a new report, which is the ACC constraint shadow price. Here we have an example of that, and this report displays the shadow prices for binding interval intervals for the day ahead 15 minute and five minute time frames. The support may help inform the market participants why the LMP at their location does not reflect their bid price. Next, we're going to uh, show an update to the transmission limits report. Um, this is in our market participant portal. And it provides, let's see, the transmission limits report, which you can see here is in the market modeling data. Um, you would need an NDA to gain access to that, but um, we are including those ACC limits in that transmission limits report. Next is CMRI. Oops, let's go back here. Um, for CMRI, there's two reports that are impacted that exist already, and there's one new report called the ACC definition. Um, in the uh, interval variable energy resource forecast, there is now the component ID field, um, and so you you will see that there. And um, that that is added to this existing report. We also have the variable energy resource report forecast. And again, these are both in the forecast tab. This one, you uh, have, it also has the component ID column added to it. And you have the option of doing this in for day ahead, locked hour ahead, or rolling hour ahead. And the locked hour ahead is for previous trade intervals. It forecast it is the forecast that we is used by the market for that interval that was used. Um, for future intervals, it's going to display the recent forecast, the most recent forecast available, and it uses the five minute forecast data averaged up to hourly. The rolling hour ahead, uh, the most recent forecast that was available on the date and time specified. It also uses five minute forecast data averaged up to hourly. So for example, if the trade out date and hour is selected, it would display the latest forecast available at for all hours the forecast 
was being sent for that hour, if that makes sense. So these reports exist, but we do have one new report, and that is your ACC definitions. The ACC definitions are going to provide a list of constraints, um, the start date and end date, and the resources aligned with those constraints. So that is what that report is. All right, now I did want to leave some time for this. I'm sorry, we're probably going to go over a little bit, um, but um, we're planning uh, to have some uh, new information in our ISO today and today's outlook. We have these new hybrid charts. First, let me say the data in here, this is a mock-up, so it's not really showing any real true data, um, but um, this report, um, is uh, will show the hybrid trends. So you can see we have here the hybrid cells and batteries, and then we have the um, pie chart shows the contribution of each type of fuel to the current resource fleet. So the megawatts in these, high, these new hybrid charts are also reflected in the graphs for each fuel type. So you don't want to add them together. So for example, the solar portion of the hybrid chart is included in the solar line of the supply graph. So if you were to add them together, you would be double counting. So the same goes for wind and for the batteries. The battery trend chart also includes batteries associated with hybrids. So uh, the key distinction here that you need to keep in mind is that during the current transition process for the hybrid resources, those resources that are not currently providing component telemetry data, meaning data for your wind, solar, and battery separately, the full energy output for those hybrid resources will still show up in this chart as in the battery part of this chart until that component level data is provided. Um, you can see at the top here, uh, there is a, a toggle by type. Um, the, first, the top just has the total uh, batteries, but the bottom breaks out the hybrid batteries as well. But I, my understanding is if we do not have the component data for those hybrid resources yet, they're going to still, all of the output is still going to be included in the standalone batteries. We're still working on these, uh, these charts for ISO today and today's outlook. So, um, Stay tuned because if things change, we will update the presentation. So what this means that is if you're trying to evaluate data related to battery resources from before and after Feb 23, let's take a look at what this means. The battery chart may not provide comprehensive battery data when you're comparing pre and post February 23 data. So Pre-February 2023, the chart includes standalone batteries. We're talking about the battery chart. It includes standalone batteries and co-located, and all the components of hybrid resources. So the wind component of the hybrid, the solar and the battery, are included in the battery trend chart. After February 1st, um, again, we'll still have those standalone batteries in the battery chart and all the components of those hybrid resources that are not providing their component level telemetry yet. Because if we don't have the data, we can't break it out between the solar, the wind, the battery. So I just want you to be aware of that. So the key takeaways here is prior to February 2023, the battery chart has more, more than just battery data. And post February 2023, 23, the goal is to have all the hybrid resources providing all the component level telemetry, but until that happens, the battery trend chart is not purely going to have battery information. So it's not going to be possible to get a completely accurate picture of battery trends when you're trying to compare data between these timeframes. It's like comparing apples and oranges. So there will be notes added to the battery trend chart that explain this discrepancy. Wanted to make sure we got that in there. Uh, we are one minute over, but certainly we are opening this for questions. Any questions on any of the reports, the ISO today, 
uh, and today's outlook, uh, anything else? Cindy, we have a couple of questions, um, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to address this one today, but um, Zach S. asks, not sure if this question was answered, does AGC slash regulation set point respect to the dynamic limits? And it looks like, um, uh, Mike, do you, can you answer that question? Do we need to take this one back or do we have an answer for this? Hey, Cindy, this is Gabe Bertel from Policy again. Uh, the mm -hmm. answer is yes, it does. All right, thank you, Gabe. Zach? Okay. And then Kathleen had a question and um, I put a link to the policy initiative page, but she's um, asking if we can share the specific meeting um, that followed. Uh, she thought it was an October 6th meeting where uh, it was discussed, uh, the DC and AC were discussed. Do you remember, recall what date that was or where we could find those materials, Cindy? Uh, so we recorded the, the first session, which I believe you put here. Um, the second session, uh, Priyanka, I don't think we recorded that one, um, but I think we, uh, if you have, um, that was a specific meeting that followed. Um, it could have been on October 6th. Um, I, I don't remember the exact date of that meeting. Uh, maybe we can get we can get that Hi. for you. This is Kathleen. Yeah, I just can say I also emailed Priyanka and CC Gabe, okay. so I I can when I so no need to belabor this. But thank you so much for bringing it up again. Okay. All right. Um, I did have another question, though, on the ISO today. Since I'm unmuted, mm -hmm. can I ask my question? Um, that's super helpful update. Love, the, love, love ISO today. So, in my 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 love for that that landing page, let me ask a quick question. So, on the battery charts that you provide on ISO today. Um, this isn't a question. This is more just a request to consider additional enhancements, if it's possible, whether it's here or somewhere else. I'm just going to put it out into the ether while people who, who have that power are listening. Um, it would be super helpful if these charts showed the total uh, discharge amounts in megawatts and frankly megawatt, but the total discharge amount and total charge amount, and then showed a net line. What you show on your battery chart is the net of the system, and in, and it would be really helpful if you showed it as with three three data points: discharge, charge, and the net. And if you would consider that for future enhancements, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. I well, answer a lot of questions about this chart having to do with it being a net value. It confuses people a great deal. So, right. greatly appreciate it. Thank you. We will uh, take a note of that. Um, I see that Chris Devin had a question suggesting requesting that the ISO consider providing a system wide state of charge chart on the website to supplement charging and discharging. Another good, good suggestion, and we will take that back. Thank you. Are there Maybe. any other questions? We do have a hand, uh, Mike. Um, so, Mike, if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I know we're five minutes over. The, just quickly to follow up on Zach's question. So, w was there any uh, testing done on the interplay between the dynamic limits and the AD AGC dispatch, or is it just assumed that the, uh, the, the process is, is going to work as intended? Can anyone answer that question? Okay, you know, Mike, I'm going to, I'll have to check in on that um, and we will, uh, we'll get back on that one as well. Okay, thank you. Make sure that all the questions that I'm telling everybody that we're going to get back on, it's going to be posted publicly. So everybody gets the answers to all of these questions. All right. All right, any other final questions? All right, well, uh, as a wrap up, just a reminder, we talked about the interconnection, the changes for that. 
the new master and sub ACCs, the forecast option for scheduling coordinators, limits, AOP displays, all of our new and updated reports. We also talked about metering and telemetry. And I just want to let you know, there is going to be an updated BRS coming out, I think in the next week or so. Um, or yeah, I'm not sure of the date, but it's getting finalized right now. And it mostly is concerned with uh, uh, hybrid resource to see, and it's going to have updates like TIGEN, hybrid forecast, things like that. So um, any final questions before I give you back your time? All right, thank you so much. Uh, sorry, it took a little bit longer than I expected, but I think we had some great conversation, great questions, and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And this ends our presentation, and I'm gonna stop the recording. <laughs>